you all. Yeah, so good morning again, everyone, to this session. Um, so I'll allow you, Lady T. Hello, everybody. Good morning. How are you today? Good morning, Lady T. Morning, Lady T. Yeah, so. Um, good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Teklan Bunwe, and um, I know you. I am an investment banker by profession. And I specialize in uh, investment funds. So I am um, we from Cloud Community Lead and an AWS Community Builder. I am two times AWS certified, and I'm currently preparing for the AWS Solutions Architect Professional Exam. So. Today we will be looking at uh, the AWS uh, billing and pricing and the support plan. So this will be a two days lecture. And um, today we were in the today we are going to look at uh, the general information regarding AWS pricing. We're going to look at the AWS pricing fundamentals, AWS pricing models, AWS purchasing models, the AWS free tier and offers, and we're going to look at some AWS cost tools and the AWS organization. And in the next class, we are going to look at the support plan and the AWS marketplace. So today, I would like all of you to be alive in this session, ask questions, and ensure that we all understand and we are learning together. So do not hesitate to stop me and ask any question. So before you leave here today, this is what you should, even if you don't remember what anything, you should remember these few uh, uh, messages out there, the general information. So, of all of us, by now all of us must have known that AWS offers a pay-as-you-go approach for its pricing. And uh, you only pay for the services that you use and the time that you use them. And you know that you should know that once you stop using them, there are no charges. There are no long-term contracts. There are no licenses needed. And you can also, you can compare it to how you pay your utility bills. So it's like when you put on, the elect when you put on your electricity, your metal starts to turn. And once you put it off, the metal stops. This is how you can compare the AWS price, you pay as you go. So if you're leaving today, you should remember these major points. Are we all there? Hello? Oh, yeah. Yes, Lindsay. Yes. Make sure that by the time you're leaving today, have this in the back of your mind. Even if you forget anything, everything, you shouldn't forget this because this is our main take home message for today. So we are going to look at the, the three drivers, the cost drivers. The first one, we're going to look at com uh, compute. You pay for the time you spend computing. For example, the EC2 instance uptime. When you're running an instance, you pay for that time. And whenever you stop, you don't pay anything. So when you're using a uh, Windows, you pay hourly. And when you're using uh, Linux, you pay per second. So you use AWS compute services and pay only 
for the time that you use them. This message should really stick. So, the second is storage. So, you pay for the data you store in the cloud per gigabytes. And you only pay for the space that you have used in the cloud. But because the cloud is, is big, you can scale up and scale down when you don't need this, when you don't need the space anymore. You also pay for data transfer. So AWS charges per gigabyte. You only pay for the transfers that are leaving, that the data that transfers out of the AWS. The, the data that is coming inside AWS, you, they're all free. So there is no charge for data between AWS services in the same region. So you should remember this very well. So data charge is by gigabytes and you pay only for the data transfer out of AWS and between, uh, AWS, between AWS regions. Data coming into AWS is free and, uh, and there is no charge uh, for data, be data transfer between AWS services within the same region. I'm sure you all have learned about the regions, availability zones. So when data is transferred within the same region, there is no charge. There are three main AWS pricing models. You have the pay as you go. You have the safe when you reserve and you have the pay less by using more. I would like to throw a question to the house. Let's just think out of the box. I, as I've said, pay as you go is, we all know that you pay like when you're doing your electricity, when you're using your electric, your utility bills, you put, when you put on the light, your meter starts to turn, you pay, when you turn it off, that's it. Can you guess? what safe when you reserve will mean. Can anybody guess? Can I? Try. Uh, in my own understanding, I'll say when you reserve, kind of, oh, safe when you reserve. Okay, the moment you are, Kind of tricky. <laughs> no, feel free. Just express yourself. There's, here we are learning. We are all learning. Okay, let me let me take for instance. If you pay in advance, mm -hmm. if you if you would like book in advance, mm -hmm. like might be you are saving some income. Like you pay lesser when you book to That's use. That's very correct. Ahead of very time. correct. It's very correct. So you see, it says it lets, it lets you provision your resources in advance for one or three years of commitment. And when you do that, definitely you save when you reserve. And who is going to try pay less by using more? Just think of our normal business marketing strategy. When you go to the market and if I'm going to buy one thing and if you're going to buy uh, in bulk, what, how, what, is, what do you think? Anyone wants to try? Uh, let me try this one. Yeah. Uh, anything we buy in bulk, we know the prices, uh, they are lesser than when we buy them single. Like uh, this wholesale, you know, people buy from wholesale to sell single dust relating to businesses. Yeah. So we just pay less by using more. Is like uh, we 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 get the services at a lesser price when we want more. When we get them more. Correct. 
So you see, we are all awake. So let's take the first one, pay as you go. So you pay only for capacity and resources that you use. And when you do that, you know, you don't, it means that you don't, you don't, you've not yet, you've not tied your money somewhere. So you can easily adapt to things that are changing. You know, if, like if you were supposed to, to, uh, for example, you want to, to, to do a business, you tie down all your money and then you don't have, if there is something to change, yeah, exactly. you, you, or you've already bought things in that office or bought or, or tie down your money in, in some, in some of the business things that you want, you want to do to use. But in this case, you you just use the services. You, you rent the services in the cloud, and if you the if you you if some other thing comes up that you, you need to do, you just go ahead and do it. You have not tied your money down because you just pay for what you use. And when your business needs more capacity, you just scale up. You you don't need to to plan. I mean, you don't need to, to, to plan any uh, foreseen capacity. You just scale up in the, in the cloud. So, and when you need less capacity, you just scale down. So for pay as you go, you just pay as you go. So um, the second one is save when you reserve. So you can invest in reserve capacity for services like EC, Amazon EC2 and RDS. So when you reserve, you can save up to about 75% compared to the on-demand model. So you can, you can choose, you can either choose to reserve for one year and for three years. So one thing you should understand, if you're reserving for three years, the discount, you, you benefit more than when you're reserving for one year. But if you are not reserving at all, you are spending more money. So. So there are three uh, major uh, reserve instance options. So you have the all upfront, you have the partial upfront, and you have the no upfront payment. And this is what we're going to see in the, in the next, in the slides coming after this. So by using reserve capacity, organizations can minimize risk and better manage their budget. So you save when you reserve. If you reserve for three years, you pay less. You reserve for one year, you pay less than somebody who is just uh, uh, paying as you go. So, <clears throat> like I said, there are three um, reserve instance options. So you can either choose to reserve for one year or for three years. So when you pay all upfront, you have a larger discount, the largest discount. When you do a partial payment, when you say when you, uh, when you want to refer to pay all upfront, it's called the ORI, the A U R I. So that is all, all upfront reserve instance, right? So when you pay partial upfront, it's called the PURI tool, and then the no upfront payment is called the NORI. So as you can see here, look at this uh, diagram here. They reserve for one year, all upfront, and they are saving 43%. They are gaining 43% savings. Here, they reserve for one year, but it's um, a partial payment, and they, are, they can, they can sa they save 42%. And here, when the, the person pays, the, the client pays uh, no upfront, and yes, they have a savings because they are reserved, but uh, the savings are lesser than when you pay all upfront or partial upfront. And one thing you should ensure that um, when you're paying all upfront, you should ensure that you're using your the minimum resources that you have to use because you have the you, you have the ability to scale up, and uh, when you and not to scale down. I know that uh, when you already pay for something, you've already reserved something, you cannot actually uh, want want to take it back or the only option will be if you want to convert it and that will definitely be a little bit more um, uh, complicated you need to have a converted uh, instance but for now just know that when you're reserving ensure that you're you're using your the minimum resources that you have to use okay 
So the third up is pay less by using more. So the more services you use with AWS, the lesser you pay. So with AWS, you can get volume based discounts when you when you're buying and like we've already we've already said as you as you your users increase, you benefit from massive economies of scale. It's like what um, the from the, the former speaker just said. When you're buying in bulk, definitely the prices will be will be, will be low. So uh, pricing for S3 and data transfer out in EC, uh, out of EC2 is tiered. That means uh, the more you use them, the less you pay per gigabyte. So, and one thing you should know is that as you, as all these payments, as you pay less by using more, when your business, as businesses grow, you, AWS uh, gives you options or services that can help you uh, show you where, how to lower prices based on how frequent you, you, you access the data. So, uh, you, an example of this is the AWS uh, storage service portfolio. So uh, you will come across these services more and more and more of them. So uh, you pay less by using more. So you can see here the this is in story. The you in here, the first the first client here is using up to 50 terabytes of storage, and what he pays per month is. 0 0.023 gigabytes per month. And the second here is using from 51 to 100 terabytes of storage. It's more, and you see that the amount, the pay per month is less. And you see here from 500 terabytes and above of storage, they are paying 0 0.021 and, uh, gigabytes, per, gigabytes per month. So you pay less by using more. Is there any question? So let's look at the AWS from- yeah, yeah, please, I have a question. Yeah. Okay, when it comes to storage, do we uh, pay as we use do we pay for the storage we've used or we pay before using them? I don't know if my question is, I don't know if you've got some question. Like, do we, because, uh, but you need we, to be able to give you a price, they must know what you have used, right? Okay, so we use the services first, we use the storage first before paying for it. Yes, or, or, if you, or you can, Ban, can you? You want to throw more light on this? Um, I'm trying to understand your question. Can you repeat that again, please? Just let me talk about it. <laughs> okay, because uh, I saw the you you said when it comes to storage, you said something like uh, we pay we we no, pay I'm for this about, we pay I for the, about the the amount of storage that, for example, the quantity of fifty terabytes. Mm -hmm. It's about the, ter the, the space that whenever, mm -hmm. if you are using this kind of space, this is the amount you pay. So the more you increase the space that you use or the storage that you use, the less are you are paying. Okay, no, you said uh, the, 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 the things we pay for, you, you are talking of compute, you spoke of storage. Yes. Another storage, you said we pay for the services we've used. Yes. That, was, right. that was like yes. in past times, we pay for the services we've used. Yeah. So yes. This is where my question comes in. Do we pay for the services before we use them or after we've used them? It's after your bill always comes at the end of the month. Yeah. AWS always calculate your bill at the end of the month, what you have used, and then you pay for it. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so but I just, uh, yeah. So you receive uh, your bills at the end of the month. That's why you should always be careful on what you do in your account because the bill comes at the end of the month. Hello, I, I also have please. Questions. I just want to clarify. Uh, want us to clarify with a little bit on something here. Yeah. As we think that the storage too also can also benefit from end of the pricing models. 
or is it that only for storage is only at the end of the month or can you use the prepaid or any of the pricing models? Please let's not, these are the reserve instance options. Very well. So that's for instances, right? This is for instances. Not for storage. There's a difference between instance and storage, right? Okay. Okay. Are you, are, is your answer, are you, are, you, are you clear with that? Yeah, I'm clear, thank you. Oh. So it's another question. Come on. Any please. other question? Yeah, please. Can you help me go back to the previous uh, picture? Yeah. So I wanted to clear my understanding in the pricing model here. Yeah. This uh, 50 terabyte, which is 23 gigabyte per month, and then instead here, 51 to 100 terabyte, and it is. Uh, only 22. Is it because of the duration that this guy who is using 51 to 100 terabyte have uh, gotten into contact with the AWS that has bring down the price? Or is it just, it's just normal that when you are buying more, you pay less? When you're buying more, you pay less. Just remember again, as so, so as it says uh, on that title, right, uh, as explained again, remember you are paying for what you use. Just yeah. go to the storage again. You are oh, paying for storage. Yeah, it says you are paying for what you, I think, I think it's that way, right? See, pay less by using more. Mm. So at the end of the month, if you have used up to 50 terabytes per storage, you'll be calculated with that price. And if at the end of the month, you have used up from 51 to 100, 100 terabyte, your calculation will be on that one. So that means you'll be paying cheaper. Okay, I understand that. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, remember again, cloud computing is the on demand of, uh, of, of IT resources. So you don't have to pay for storage when you have not yet used them, right? So you pay as you go along. So just to clarify, because you're asking, is it that the person has bought more? So remember, you, there's no need to be buying more. You always uh, uh, pay as you go along, and then when you need more, then you increase. So the, because if you buy more and then you don't use it, then it's waste. Then it's same like traditional IT. Yeah. Yeah, I was relating. I was relating that with the previous uh, line that was talking about the one to three upfront payment. You know. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, and that is for instances, Instance. right? This is storage. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. That's that the difference. Yeah. yeah, storage and instances are two different. Two different yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for that question. Those questions. So uh, we're going to move on to the free tier. So I'm sure all of you are aware that uh, once you have an account on AWS, we, all of us are talking about the free tier. The free tier. So you know you have a free tier right so um with a free tier you can gain free hands-on experience on the aws platform its products and the services so the capacity of the free tier can comfortably cover all the demos for this course and there are three types you know we have the the, the when they talk of uh, the there are some uh, uh services that are are, are come always free so these tiers do not expire and are available to new and old AWS customers. Take for example, accessing the documentation of AWS. You can, they, those, they don't expire. You can, you can check the documentation from today to, it doesn't expire. So, and you have the, the second is the 12 months free. And this, is, uh, this one is only for AWS customers like me and you who have registered and we, are, we have, we registered and then we have for 12 months, we've signed up, we have, we signed up to the AWS console on a particular date. And we have an expiring date where we, where if you have any running instances after this expiring um, date, you will have to start paying the standard pay as you go. Uh, if, uh, for, um, if you have any of the, any instances running. So um, you also have what you call the trials. There are some uh, short uh, 
um, free trials that begin only when you activate that particular service. And once that period, uh, period is expired, you have to pay the standard pay as you go. So uh, I encourage you us all to make use of the, the free tiers that we, the free tier that we have. And if you want to know what is uh, included in the free tier, please, uh, you can see that you have 750 hours of Amazon EC2 um, uh, compute hours. You have five gigabytes of storage. You have um, 750 hours for, uh, for database. For, I, mean, I mean, you can, for RDS, you can you go through and look at them and try to make use of any of them when you're studying. These are free as long as you, you have the AWS uh, account. Any questions on the free tier? No? Any questions on the free tier? No? Seems no question. I just want to add that maybe for those who uh, we have not yet talked about the free tier, let me just drop that. So the free tier is when you create an AWS account, right? The first time you create an AWS account, I know that um, I mentioned that if anyone is having an issue creating that, they should let us know. But when you create an AWS account, these are the things that AWS allow you to use for free. So uh, the EC2, the number of hours you can have running and all of this. So these are just figures, right? But uh, in general practice, even when I look at these figures, um, I always just know that the guiding principle is when you do a lab and you are not using it, it's just better than to just uh, delete the resources. But you always get, um, if you are already using more than the free tier, AWS will always send you a message to your email account to let you know that um, you are consuming more than the required amount. So you'll get to understand these figures as you go with time. So if you don't really make sense of them now, don't worry. It's just, yeah, figures, but you'll get to know them better with time as you use your account. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to, uh, to, to look at the AWS cost tools. And uh, we are going to look at, um, the first one, we are going to look at the AWS TCO calculator. And um, so and like this is a free tool that uh, allows organizations or, or clients to estimate the cost of saving of using AWS cloud versus the on-premise data centers. So this calculator helps you to, to check what you will gain uh, if you, you use uh, cloud services over your traditional data centers. So the, uh, these are these, uh, the aid of the TCO calculator is used when organizations want to move to the cloud. And um, it provides a detailed set of reports which can be used for executive presentations. So if you really want to move, if a company wants to move to the cloud, you use the calculator to calculate what it will cost, what you will gain, and this can give, and then you can get a report which can be used for executive presentation to let the people know what and what they can benefit moving into the cloud. And it also gives uh, options to modify assumptions that best meet the different needs of your company. So um, you should know that this uh, calculate, a TCO calculator is used when organizations want to move to the cloud and it's used to compare the savings that you will get uh, using uh, AWS over um, on-premise data centers. So we have the AWS pricing calculator. So that was the TCO which was used to compare uh, what you would gain when you move from when uh, uh, on premise and uh, on premise to cloud what you will gain but this the pricing calculator is now used to calculate the cost of running specific aws services and on this 
pricing calculator. You can try uh, solutions. You can try, uh, you can model solutions before you try to build them. And on this, you can also, uh, when you, you can see uh, what it will cost you, what, what the things that are behind, behind the estimates or the costs. And uh, by, by using this, you can also look for available instant types. You try them and, and see which one meets the, your company need. And also it enables you to, to make informed decisions about the AWS pricing. And you, want, you have to know that you don't need any experience in the cloud to be able to use the AWS pricing calculator. So uh, if you, there's a TCO calculator, there is the AWS pricing calculator. So the main difference is the fact that one of them is used to compare what, uh, what you will gain when you move to the cloud. But this other one is already in the cloud. You're using it to model, to actually build solutions before you, you, you build them on, on your, in your account. You can try things out and then you, you can use it to calculate specific um, uh, services running on AWS, what it will cost you, and it helps you to make informed decisions. And uh, before, we, uh, we, if to, before we move to the next, um, the next slide I'm going to make a there's a there, the AWS has uh, now um, uh, I think combined these two. Hey, but, um, it's a, a new development, right? The two have been combined all and, and they are all under the AWS pricing calculator. So this uh, I think the link we will share in the in the forum so that you can you can now see that but. Sometimes it, the TCO can appear in your exam question. So it's good for you to know the difference that this one is used for to estimate cost savings yeah? when you leverage uh, AWS Cloud over um, uh, using on-premise on, uh, on data centers. So these ones are used when the TCO calculator is used when organizations want to move to the cloud while in the AWS pricing calculator, you use it to calculate the cost of running specific AWS services. And on it, you can model solutions. You can try things before you actually build them on in your, in your account. You can explore the different prices. You can try to know what is behind them and also make informed decisions on different, as different uh, resources and their pricing. So you don't need any uh, for before knowledge in cloud to be able to use the AWS pricing uh, calculator. So, uh, um, Brian, would you, would you help me share the link uh, in the forum? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So we are going to, uh, the next uh, cost tool we're going to handle today is AWS budgets. And um, before we go into it, I would like anybody what what does it when you make a budget for yourself what does that mean can anybody just don't look don't imagine don't look at it in the aws context when you give a, when you put a budget for yourself what does it mean can anybody say can anybody respond to that hello yeah yes no. yeah. i think uh it's the amount that you estimate that you're going to spend on your need within a defined time period. Thank you. Thank you, Napoleon. So um, when, I, when you talk of that's that's the amount that you, you define for yourself that you want to spend. So in AWS, as an organ when organizations are moving to the cloud, they, they would like, they want to, to be cautious. So they want to plan in it to, to, to set up, um, uh, they want to plan to see uh, about and set expectations around what it will cost them to run the organization in the cloud. So they, they set budgets and then uh, they set these custom budgets to help them track their costs and usage in the cloud. So when they, you set these budgets, you can also set alerts or, or, or alarms or notifications to, to, to you can set you can arrange to make sure that a notification is sent to you when you are almost getting to that amount that you set for yourself or when you've already reached the amount. 
So when your forecasted cost and usage have, when you've exceeded it, you can receive and you can set up an alert to receive um, a, a message that, uh, oh, Tecla, you are, you are getting to, to, to your, your, your threshold, the budget threshold. So for example, I want to use uh, 30 euros on AWS uh, uh, every month. And I may set an alarm, an alarm or an alert to say when I when my when my expenditure gets to 25 or 28 euros, please notify me. And and then when you notify me, uh, maybe I will then I maybe I set up an automatic automatic uh, answer to say okay, continue. Or I can say no, I stop the instance. So you can configure specific actions to react to your cost and user status uh, so that um, the actions can be either auto executed automatically or they will need your approval, especially when it comes to overspending. You know, so for custom budgets, uh, uh, custom budgets to, to meet your needs, you need to stay informed with alerts and reports, and these reports can be can be received annually, quarterly, monthly, or even daily, depending on your business needs. So do we have any question? No? Okay, we're going to, to now we're going to look at the AWS Cost Explorer. So this is a tool that helps you visualize understand and manage your AWS cost and usage over time. So with the AWS Cost Explorer, you can create a custom report to analyze your cost and usage data. And you can also analyze your data at a higher level. So that means that uh, to include the total cost and usage across all your accounts. So this you can see on the Cost Explorer. And with, the, with this cost explorer, you can actually look deep into, an, into your cost uh, uh, report and, and, and uh, identify the trends or areas where you are spending a lot. And you can also detect any abnormalities in your account. You can, you can also check the things that uh, the cost drivers, pinpoint the cost drivers. So you can also set a time period when to review uh, this, when to view this, uh, to this data. Either you can set it for monthly or daily, just depending on your own uh, business need. So it can also help you choose an optimal savings plan because you can see where you are, uh, are spending more money and when you are not spending more money. That can help you also. So, and it gives you, it can give you a forecast for up to three months based on your previous usage. So this, I want you to imagine the cost explorer like a virtual diagram where you can see your costs that is spread, spread, uh, spread down by service, cost tags, the prediction for three months, and also recommendations for cost optimization. So just imagine this virtual diagram or dashboard where you have all your costs in it and they are categorized in different um, like services, cost tax, predictions for three months and recommendations. So um, is there any question? Any question? No? Nope. Okay, we are going to move on to the cost and usage report. All these, uh, these uh, tools that I am explaining, they are very, very important because uh, your exam questions will be very tricky that you need to understand them. You need to really understand them. So uh, the AWS cost and usage report. So this report contains um, a, a comprehensive set of AWS cost and usage data with the AWS services pricing and reservation. So this is a report that, 
that lists the usage for each service category by account and its IAM users. So it also, if you've created any tags in your account, these tags will they're being the the if the tags are activated for they are activated for cost allocation purposes, and then this report can also be cut, uh, customized to aggregate your user data hourly, daily, or monthly, depending on what your your business needs. And also, the most important thing is that this uh, it's it this report come is uh, delivered in CBS format and it is uh, kept in a, an S3 bucket that you specify. So the cost and usage report is a comprehensive set of AWS cost and usage data with AWS services, pricing, and reservation. So this is delivered in CBS format and to an S3 bucket that you specify. So we have the AWS cost allocation tags. So um, when you talk of a tag, what does that mean to you? Can anybody tell me what a tag is? No? You need to talk. You need to speak. Let's have a conversation. What's a tag? Don't look at it from the AWS context. Just try it. Let's try to understand what it is. What's the tag? Uh, the tag, I would associate it with the price tag from a supermarket where you have like the prices on it, but um, no. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So um, when we... Hello, yeah, I didn't hear you. I just uh, want to say, it's a label, it's the same thing. As like a label, yes. So, yeah. So while the, yeah. So while tags are used to organize AWS resources, cost, we are talking of cost allocation tags are used to track AWS cost on a detailed level. These are used to track AWS cost at a detailed level. So if you label something, if you tag something, whenever they are reporting it in the cost and usage report, you can be able to identify what that thing that you tagged or you labeled, right? So once the cost allocation tags are activated, so AWS integrates it into this, uh, this re their cost and, and usage report, and it makes it easier for all of for people, clients and customers to categorize and track their costs. So there are two types of cost allocation tags. There's one that is generated by AWS. So it's called the AWS generated tags. So these are the, these tags define, cre are defined, created and generated by AWS. And you also have the user defined tags, which are defined by you and created by, by you, the customer. And the reason is that at least there are some things that you, maybe you want to know particularly what a specific service is costing you. So by giving, by giving a tag to this service in your cost and usage report, you can be able to identify what you've spent on that particular item. So, uh, and you should know that both the, AWS generated tags and the user tags are activated separately. So like in this uh, instance here, we have uh, uh, two Amazon EC2 instances, and you can see we have the tags, we have the cost, cost center tag, and we have the stack tag, right? So, um, here you can see that the cost center, if the, the, the cost center uh, is uh, 78925, and the user tag for the first, for the first uh, uh, EC2 instance is test. So, which means that uh, those that are doing testing, uh, you can know how much you've spent. 
in the in the report you're going to if you want to know what you are spending on those that are doing testing on this particular services you you will check by this tag and if you look at here the user the, the stack is production so on your cost in your cost and usage report you're going to see that there will, there will be a, a a a section or a tab for the 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 the, the the testing and that for the production so it can help you really get a detailed cost of what you spend for in different services and you can also uh, activate the aws generated tag by using the is it created by and then uh, the created by tag uh, tracks who created who created the resource so if this tag will tell you who created the resource. So, um, so you should, uh, you know that these tags are meant for, to help you uh, dig that deep uh, details for your detailed cost in your, for you to identify where you, what you actually spend uh, for specific services. And that's why most of the time, why companies, organizations will tag certain, uh, things to know, to be able to have this uh, report. Yeah. So um, the AWS cost, uh, the, this is generated in, in CVS file. It's just a, a, a recap. It's generated in CVS file, and then it is grouped by your active tags. And you can also customize the tags in different categories, such as uh, the cost center, such as application, so application names, um, the owners, so that it can uh, help you organize your cost across multiple services. The cost and usage report also contains uh, your, your AWS cost for a billing period. So at the end of every uh, uh, billing period, you have this report. And then the, the report also includes uh, both tagged and untagged resources so that you can clearly organize the charges for your resources so for example i said for example if you tag a resource with an application name so you can be able to track the total cost of that single application that runs on your on those resources so this will help you actually uh, uh, if you tag the resource with a name, with an application name, you can actually know how much you spent on that application. Okay. Any questions? I have a question, please. Yeah. Yes. Can you please um, explain a little bit more the difference between the cost and usage reports and cost, is it cost explorer? Okay, the cost explorer is a like a virtual. Uh, it's it's like the cost explorer. It's 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 like let me call it a, not a dashboard, but it's like a virtual dashboard, right? Where you can actually see how your your cost is spread down according to the different services cost tags. The prediction for it gives you a prediction for three months and then you can get you can also have recommendation for cost optimization right and you can in the cost explorer you can uh actually uh, uh, custom your report while in the in the the the, the usage report this is a report that gives you this this um this uh, your a comprehensive set of report that gives you the cost and usage data. So, did any did any, okay? No, it's a it's a message from them. So the 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 cost explorer you use it to explore. You can visualize and understand the cost. Here you can you can just look at it and pinpoint areas where you are spending more and try to understand which is the best plan for you. And it can give you a forecast for 
about three months, what it was going to cost you for three months based on your previous uh, uh, experience, based on your previous usage. But meanwhile, this uh, 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 cost and usage report, report is a report that you, 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 you can activate or you receive with all this, with all your, your expenditures, with all what you have spent, all the services uh, with the different tags. And you can, on this cost and usage report, you can, go, you can also see the details of what you have spent. But the cost and usage report will not give you a prediction for three months of what your cost will be. Just to add, Lady T, um, a cost and usage report, as you have indicated, <laughs> indicated it, is also a file. You receive it as a file, like an Excel sheet. But then the cost explorer, as you heard, you can visualize it. Uh, do check the chat. I've sent a picture of the cost explorer. You can see how it's visualized. But the cost and usage uh, report is just a file that you receive in an Excel format. Thank you, Mr. Ban. Uh, so when you go to the council under billing, is that the cost um, and usage or is that the cost explorer? Like when you have the, the your bills for end of more AWS, um, when you check your bills under billing. Yeah, it's always the explorer. explorer. You always check, it's always the explorer, yeah. Where you okay, always have the you. diagrams. Yeah, that's the best color, yeah, of course, it's color. Okay. Thank okay. you. So we are going to move on to the AWS organizations. Okay, sorry. So AWS organization, this is um, account, it's an account management service. And uh, with the organizations, you can centrally manage all the your policies across multiple organized uh, accounts. Usually there is one master account and uh, you can leverage consolidated billing and payment for all your accounts in the organization. So you can use one account to pay the bills of all the other accounts that are in your organization. And with the AWS organization, you can automate account creation and management in your organization. So you can integrate the AWS organization with other services to help you define central configurations like centralized loggings, security standards, audit requirements, and also resource sharing. So you can share resources in, um, uh, between your accounts. For example, if you if you do a reserve instance, if you buy a reserve instance and for one account and you cannot use it, if the other accounts are under your organization, you can use it in, in another account under your organization. So the AWS organization is available to all AWS customers at no additional charge. And this is a very, very important service where you have a master account used to pay all the bills of all the other accounts. And then, um, and you can now, you can use, you can centrally manage all the policies on, in your multiple accounts. So you can use the AWS organization, as you can see here, to create new accounts, or invite existing accounts to join your organization. You can use it to group accounts into organizational units by use case or work stream. You can use it to apply policies to accounts and organizational units, such as the service control policies, which create permission boundaries. And you can also enable AWS services to integrate with the with organization. Like you can use it for centralized loggings. You can also use it for other security, um, uh, uh, centralized logging into your account and to protect your account. So 
Here you have the AWS organization, just for you to visualize. There's a, there's a root account or there's a master account. And here you have an account being opened for organizational, uh, uh, it's for this organizational unit. So you have another account here and under this account, you have sub accounts. So this could be an organization, a, a company where you have, this could be H, the HR team. And then this could be the, the finance team and or, or operations team. And this could be, um, maybe finance where the, the, the accesses and the, 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 the accesses that these, uh, the people in the operations need are different from the ones from finance and are different from the ones for operations. So by, by be, being in an organization, you can easily grant different accesses or let me call it service control policies to these different organizational uh, units. Do you understand? Is it okay? Perfect. Okay. So what are service control policies? So these are the organizational policies used to manage permissions in your organization. Uh, they can offer you maximum permission for all your accounts in your, all the accounts in your organization. They can also help you to ensure that your account stays within the organizational access control guidelines. And they are only available in an organization that has all features enabled. So which means that if you're open, if you have an account and you only tick consolidated billing, so this will not be applicable. So you have to have all features enabled and, and, and the SCPs can be applied to users. It can be applied to accounts can be applied to organizational units to control access to AWS resources and services. So the reason we are doing uh, the, uh, the AWS organization is very, very important because you need to know that you have a central or a central account which is used to pay all the bills. And from this, uh, with this in this organization, you can easily delegate uh, uh, or assign policies to the different groups and you centrally manage the account. You can automate account creation. You can do a lot of uh, things to control and keep your, your environment safe in um, AWS. So, so the major take home messages, message for, for the AWS uh, uh, organization is that you have one bill. So you get one bill for multiple accounts. You have all these accounts. For example, you have here, you have the dev, you have the test, you have production, and they have other accounts under them. So for all these accounts, they have only one bill that goes to the master account and the, the master account pays all the bills for these accounts. So it helps for easy tracking. So you can track the charges across multiple accounts and download the combined cost and usage data all your accounts so um you can also combine the usage across all your accounts in the organization so that and you can share volume pricing discounts reserve instant discounts and saving plans so remember that there is no additional no extra fee you uh, using a uh, consolidation billing is offered at no additional cost So we have come to the end of the first part of this, uh, this um, the billing and pricing. We've looked at uh, uh, the cost drivers. We've looked at uh, the, uh, the different cost tools, the cost, uh, the TCO calculator, the AWS uh, calculate, calculator. We have the AWS pricing calculator. We have the cost explorer. We have looked at the cost and usage report. We've looked at the, um, the cost and, uh, the uh, AWS uh, cost and usage tags. We've also looked at the AWS uh, organizations. So let's see if we can remember or understand, we remember some of the things that we have learned today. Only you, if 
you have any questions. Thank you. Great. Yeah, great. Uh, Thank you very much, Lady T. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice. Okay, so since we still have some time, I just want to cover something that has been coming up and I know we've not talked about that so that um, you just capture that. I'll share that slide also after. So Lady T, I just want to talk about what is really scalability, right? Because um, I know that we have to cover that, but just think of scalability um, when in the cloud. Um, scalability always refers to the ability to increase or decrease IT resources. So let's say you have many virtual machines or many databases. What do you do if you want more? What do you do? So that ability to be able to increase them when you need more or if you don't need more, you, you, you decrease them is what is uh, scalability, having that ability, right, to do all of that. And the reason is that um, it makes you, you know, so it makes it very easy to plan when you have more workload. Let's say maybe you have a high demand uh, of workload that is coming to, let's say, it's that to say hi. An example can be like, imagine a company that is operating a website that is selling things to people, right? And then it happens that normally, you know, uh, people have, there's always Black Friday, there's always Christmas. And at that time, you have many people that are buying at that particular time. So it means that there are many uh, requests that are coming to the, uh, to the server that is hosting that website. And then if you need that, maybe another extra server should be uh, created, should be kind of like uh, added so that uh, it should carry that workload. And then maybe after Christmas, New Year, right? People don't have much money. If the expenditure mm -hmm. has gone down. It means now that, okay, they have just, uh, there's no need having two servers. So, so scalability always goes around uh, around that. Um, so that happens in, uh, yeah. That, so the public cloud gives the ability for that. And the key things that you can change when you are talking about scalability is you can either change the CPU you can maybe the disk uh, input and output, right? You have can either increase the RAM memory or maybe the network. So maybe how is the network um, of that cable, the input and the output. So those are the key things that uh, drive scalab uh, scalability. And there are two ways of doing scalability. There's something called horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling means the example I gave, uh, you can add, more uh, more servers. So maybe if you had one server running, um, let's say with a particular configuration and you have more workload that is coming in, you can decide and add another of that same kind. So when you are adding that, it's what is referred to as horizontal scaling and this picture can best explain it. So imagine you had a server with two gigabyte RAM, a virtual CPU of one, and uh, it was running and then it happens that there are more, more demand coming in and this server can no longer support. Then you add more of the same servers and when you do that is horizontal scaling. And then as I said, if it happens that after some time, uh, the, the, the amount of requests that are coming reduces, you can then remove this one and maybe remain only with one. So when you do that, it's horizontal scaling. The other option, I've written benefits of scaling here. I'll share that to you because I know this is just literature you can actually get. But the other one is something called vertical scaling. Vertical scaling is um, where you increase the size of the of the host of the server or the, or the virtual machine that you are running. So imagine you had a virtual machine that you are running and it had two gigabyte RAM, uh, one uh, virtual CPU, and it happens that uh, there's a heavy load coming. Uh, so instead of adding another one, we decided to increase by the RAM. Let's say the RAM moves from two to four, and then the virtual CPU moves from one to two. So you increase the size of the component. So the CPU, the RAM, and the storage, all of those things are, in, are increased. So this is how it will look like. So you may have the same server that is running, but then you have more load coming in. Then you, you increase the size of the RAM. So it's kind of like a bigger instance, or you can increase it again to be this bigger, right? So just see the difference between this and this other one. This one, you are increasing the size. So if this one was having just two gigabyte RAM, you add another one, this will be six gigabyte RAM. You add another two, the combination all together, 
So this was two, you add this one, it has two, then it will be four. You add another one, it will be another two. So all of them will be six, right? Um, so three of them will be running with six gigabyte, but here you are instead maintaining, you are increasing the size of the component itself. So you are not increasing the number of servers. So when we're talking about scalability, always have those um, uh, terms in mind and you can read what they are. I've just, uh, I'll that slide will also be shared. So I just wanted to make sure that let's have that um, kind of short presentation so that, because those are very important terms, what horizontal scaling is and what vertical scaling is. So one is where you are doing, uh, uh, doing that, right? Um, yeah, I think then the other thing I want to point out is I, I, some people have been asking what other course can they be doing, right? Because they have more time. Um, I know many of you, um, for those of you are, who are really busy and don't have extra time, maybe taking another course could be uh, difficult. But the recommendation is when we do the class on Monday, Tuesday, just make sure that you take some time uh, on Wednesday uh, and uh, let's say Thursday and look back at the material. The key thing is the services that we have covered, right? The ET have covered so many services today AWS Cost Explorer, AWS organization. Uh, remember the PDF that I that we did share that talk about all the services. So when we cover services like this and you follow them, you can go back on that PDF and also read a little bit about them. Because for the practitioner exam, it will always revolve around do you know the services and can you differentiate about them? And you people did a very good job this morning with the revision questions. And if you can keep that in mind, you will have covered, uh, billing and pricing covers about 16% of the practitioner exam. So if you can really master these different uh, services covered today, you will be positioning yourself for already good um, for the exam. But regarding the course that you can do, if you have listened to all the testimonies, for those of you who have been coming on Saturday and hearing uh, all the people who have been able to progress, um, you know, there is one course that I, I will recommend. It's, um, it's just the basic, uh, I, I'll ask everyone, because when you start doing Linux, right, um, it may sound like it's something difficult, but when you start doing it early and just having an idea of what it is, when you will be doing the labs much more deeper, you will realize that you'll be understanding better because when you start seeing commands, it shouldn't be the first time we are seeing them and being frightened. So we have created a group for Linux, not that we have someone who will be teaching Linux, but we can put courses there. And then if you are studying, there's already Titus who has already done well in verifying his course, he's going to be in that group. And if you have problems, we just post there, right? And then he can answer or someone can answer. We are going to have people who do Linux definitely are also be in that group um, and, and people who are already working. And if you have question on what you are doing, you shouldn't have a problem. But um, there is a course that is just two and a half hours so that's not much. So even if you decide that you spend this week or next week, we'll do that course, you should be able to complete it. So I want, and it's free, it's in Udemy. I'll recommend that, um, I'll share the course on the chat. It's like just to give you an introduction to Linux. And then after you finish that one, there's a course that is having about 10 models that um, uh, I think when the, when the, the Black Friday comes and it goes very cheap because it's now $149, which is very expensive in my view. It will go cheap at some point, um, maybe and go to about $20. That's a course I would recommend that everyone should buy because uh, to succeed in this field, you will realize that you need that skill. So this is the course that I've sent. This one is just two hours. Um, I'll really like, and then if you want to join the group, I'll send the link that you can use to join the group. Um, also on, on, on chat, the, you can join that group and just, you know, just that everyone should, should sign up for this course, create a Udemy account and try to work on, on, on doing this course. You it shouldn't, uh, even if you decide to do it for a week and try to ask as many questions as you can in that group. And then after you finish, uh, there's another, the, the group where you have the Linux course you will then be also, be, you should also be able to join that, right? So those are some of the things that um, uh, for those who have time, 
I would really say invest in that. You 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 realize that uh, when we are doing the labs or when we start the terms that you hear like Terraform, you realize that ah, you start doing them, you realize that ah, it's just the command line and it's not as complex uh, or those shouldn't frighten you as you should uh, when you hear them the first time. Yeah. So that's the, from my own end announcements. Uh, yeah, any other questions or maybe see anything to add? Yes, Ben, I have a question. Good, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I would like to know the relationship between scalability. When we talk about scalability, does it apply to upfront, when it, the scalability, does it apply to upfront pay, uh, pricing when it comes to payment? Like what we did when you pay upfront mm -hmm. and then you yeah. happen to, can you scale up or scale down your resources when you pay upfront? No, scalability is a feature. Pricing is different in the sense that um, if you need more instances, so for example, if, if it happens that, just keep this scenario in mind where if you have just one server, right? And it is mm -hmm. used for selling, maybe it has a web server on it. And through this web server, people are able to go online and buy products. And it is this server that is maintaining it. Now mm -hmm. imagine that the whole time you are, um, you are before before you go, please let me just send that. I see some people are going. Before you go, just make sure that you click the link to join the Linux course if you are joining, right? So I'll share that. So so just imagine that during uh, the Christmas period, you have many people that are buying uh, from that website. It means now that um, one server is no longer enough. Let's talk in terms of EC2. It means that the EC2 instance alone is no longer enough. Now, if you have another EC2 that is added, then of course, then you are scaling out. That means you have added one EC2. That means now you'll be paying more, right? You'll be paying more. So, so scalability is a feature, but pricing is just uh, what you will pay for, for, for what you are having. The other one of all upfront is completely different where um, like when you when you pay all upfront, so paying all upfront as stated in the course is when you have steady state process and you know that you will run them for up to one year. So uh, if you know very well that you are doing something like for a website and you know that your business will be running for one year, two years, three years, you can mm -hmm. decide to pay for that EC2 instance upfront because AWS will give you a higher discount, right? If it is, if you pay, if you say, yeah, for the instance. So for the instances that you'll be using, AWS will give a discount for that instance, for those instances. So um, scalability is just a feature, and uh, but pricing is just trying to look at how more how many resources you have used and what you pay for. Yeah, and, and of course, when you scale out, it means you are consuming more resources, and then your bill will definitely be higher. And if you reduce, if you scale down, it means you have reduced the resources, and your bill will be lower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good. So um, we will not have a lab this Friday. Next week we are having a, a test. So we'll make sure that's ready. It will just be 30 questions on a Friday just to keep your minds uh, awake and make you continue to have a feel of how the exam can look like. Yeah. So. What time on Friday in the morning or in the... It's the same time, 5.30 in the morning, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, make it. Right. <laughs> I mean, make it. Okay. Okay. Have a nice day oh. to everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day. Any other questions, Lady T? Any point you are coming in? So we only see on Monday, right? Right. So mm -hmm. no, we see on Saturday. No. Okay. I'm meaning for the course. Right. Yeah, for the course. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody. And right. do have a nice day. Mm 